for today. This is the second of three sessions on African American poetry. Uh, I realized that last week I didn't introduce the three of us who are sort of facilitating this session because I always assume that everybody I know knows everybody else I know. And so um, just to be official about it, uh, you can see our names on the on the screens anyway. I'm Linda Lanham and um, I'm the one who's charged with sort of doing the uh, historical introduction and context for the pieces. Elise Jenkins is one of our section leaders for the choir. She's also uh, the performer in our concert with a cause uh, session on African American spirituals. If you have not, if you did not hear the concert live, it is still available on the church website or the church uh, Facebook page. It's worth going back and listening to again. So uh, I encourage you to do that. And Jennifer Veach is our a uh, leader on looking at, picking out and looking at particular poems that connect with the spiritual that Elise sings. You've heard her lead us before and know that uh, she has a wide ranging interest in poetry and poets. So um, we hope that this three week session is meaningful to you both in terms of the beauty of the music and poetry and also of where this music and poetry comes from. And I said last week that um, African American poetry in America has been sung and spoken and written and recited for over 250 years. Uh, but it began with the singing. It began with the work of what James Weldon Johnson called the Black and Unknown Bards, who gave voice to what we know as spirituals. This music has become so familiar to us that I worry that we sometimes fail to give adequate recognition and respect to its origins, to where it came from. Uh, as my favorite Bible professor always says at the beginning of each introduction to the Old Testament class, these poems have come a long way to find you. So I want to open our session today with some thoughts about what W.E.B. Du Bois called the sorrow songs. Du Bois opens a concluding essay in his book, The Souls of Black Folk, with these words. They that walked in darkness sang songs, sorrow songs, for they were weary at heart. And through the haunting echo of those songs, the soul of the black slave spoke in what may be the most beautiful expression of human experience ever born in America. But over the 250 years since they were first sung, these songs have been ignored, misunderstood, and misused. We today certainly owe gratitude to perhaps the first effort to bring them to light, which was the music and the work of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Uh, in the 1870s, under the direction and vision of George L. White, they began singing concerts of American spirituals around the world. Concerts that, to quote Du Bois, again, sang these songs so deeply into the world's heart that they could never wholly forget them again. And as an aside, for those of you who've never heard the Jubilee Singers, either old recordings or contemporary ones, the current chorus has a virtual concert planned for May 21st. So I encourage you to go on to the Fisk University website and listen because they continue to be uh, marvelous interpreters of this music. Another important voice that spoke to the importance of the spiritual is a more contemporary one. The late James Cone, longtime professor of Black Liberation Theology at Union Seminary in New York, says in his book, The Spirituals and the Blues, a book that I highly commend to you if you've never read it, the power of song in the struggle for Black survival. 
That is what the spirituals are about. They invite the listener to move close to the very sources of Black existence and to experience the Black community's power to endure. But as Cohn observes, scholarly study of Black spirituals is barely a century old and began as might be expected with a view through the lens of white classical criticism. Obviously that early stage was not favorable and where it was favorable, it attempted to somehow find in this music a white source. It wasn't until the 1920s and 30s when John W. Work and James Weldon Johnson and Alan Locke, among others, reconsidered the originality and the importance of this music. It was at that point that it began to gain acknowledgement as the only considerable body of song which has come into its existence in America. In addition to their status as music, spirituals also have been examined for what they say about a variety of contexts. One of the things that scholars look at is the variations in the lyrics or the music that reflect the geography and the situations of the different people who sang these same songs. But as with the study of any sacred text, spending too much time in the details can ultimately rob this music of its heart. These songs were the way enslaved and later emancipated black people created an identity for themselves as they sought to affirm life and its possibilities in the midst of their struggle for freedom and in the face of the continuing contradictions in America's independent free society, a society that kept them from realizing the promise of which they sang. Understanding where this music came from is something that those of us whose skin is white can never truly share. But it is something we need to never lose sight of. When we lift our voices to sing, go tell it on the mountain at Christmas time, or were you there on Good Friday? or my Lord, what a morning, or let us break bread together, or I've got peace like a river, or I'm gonna live so God can use me on any given Sunday. Let us never lose sight of what writer Wright Thompson says. To hear that music and know that people like us, planters, and landowners, which we are, caused the pain that these musicians turned into beauty. Let that sound carry both histories. That beautiful music living side by side with the knowledge of what trauma summoned it. If both can exist for us at the same time, and we just might find a way to keep walking together into the light. Elise, the class is yours. Good morning and happy Sunday. The piece that I chose today was Here's One by William Grant Still. And just to give a little historical and mini bio about Grant Still. He is referred to as the Dean of Afro-American Composers. And he has had a incredible, but heavily devoted long list of accomplishments in first. He was the first black to conduct a major symphony in the United States, direct a major symphony in the deep South, conduct a major American network radio orchestra, to have an opera produced by a major American company, as well as an opera televised over a national network. 
I will type in later his website so that you can look up his publications, his compositions, and more of his accomplishments, but those are just a few. A lot of his music, including his symphonies, were overlooked, but I think nowadays musicians and contemporary composers, particularly Black composers, are referring to his music as much inspiration. And he did not compose a lot of vocal works, particularly opera. He produced a lot of symphonies, a lot of instrumental works. A lot of his works were big and huge. And his music was set from poets like Paul Lawrence Dubar, Langston Hughes, County Colin, and his second wife, Werner A. Arvey. And I think it's important that when it comes to his vocal works that were simple, it brings a sense of devotion, a uh, inner inspiration that I think we all need to find. And I think that's why I chose Here's One. Talk about a child that do love Jesus. He is one. He is one. Talk about a child that do love Jesus. He for a while at least that was beautiful um I, I guess for me the the transition is i think something we were talking about last week about those things and linda sort of gave me these words also um the things about a piece of music right that you can't put words to right the place where it touches you or as you know again to borrow from rita dove from last week you know how music right is like a woman who reaches into your chest and spreads it. Maybe the grief spreads it around. Um, something that's hard to put words to, but that we all feel. Um, so thank you for helping us feel. Um, so I want, there are three poems if we have time to get to today, I wanna to spend some time with that when Elise told us she was going to sing this song, um, I went to. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. So the poem. So the I want. There are three poets I want to talk about today. Um, one of whom, uh, the first, is a poet Robert Hayden. Um, and the reason I wanted to talk about this poem is because of the way it connects to the song we just heard, um, The Child. And maybe I, before I read this poem by Hayden, I'm gonna go back and let us see the lyrics, or at least some of the lyrics of what Elise just sang by William Grant Still. And things for me that stood out in this song were the child, of course, and that first repeating stanza, talk about a child who do love Jesus. Here's one, here's one, the repetition of that one. And then throughout the song, this child, 
who's been forgiven that idea, who's been converted that idea, and then back to the child who, who does love Jesus, who do love Jesus. So here's a poem about a child and a father. Um, and happily in each of the cases of these poems, I've got um, the poem itself, and uh, which I'm gonna read through once. And then I've got recordings of the poets reading each of these poems. And actually before I read the poem, let me show you something else. Let me show you. So this is a picture of Robert Hayden um, and maybe a little backstory on him. I realized I was gonna jump right into the poem. Um, Hayden was a very important poet in our country, um, born in 1913, um, lived to about 1980, um, grew up in Detroit, um, had a difficult childhood, was raised in part in foster families, um, but became our first African-American consultant in poetry at the Library of Congress. Um, and for him, when you look at his poetry, the African-American experience and history sort of weave throughout a lot of what he has for us. Um, Hayden, interestingly, was a practitioner, practitioner of the Baha'i faith. Um, and this poem is his. So let me switch now to back to the poem. Here's those winter Sundays. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? So that's Robert Hayden's poem. Let me share with you, if I can, um, a recording. All right. Can you all see this picture of Hayden? All right. Here is a poem that comes directly out of my boyhood in Detroit, and it's called Those Winter Sundays. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then, with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made bank fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the coal and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? This poem's always been very powerful um, to me. And I think for a lot of readers, um, this child, right? or this actually adult, right? Writing about the memories of his childhood and memories of his father. Sundays too, right? That was two simple words at the beginning of that poem. Sundays too, my father got up early, um, put on his clothes in the blue back cold, cracked hands that ached. Um, the music of this poem is very powerful. Um, and then in our second stanza, the sun wakes up. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. And then finally, in the final stanza, where the, we see the sun remembering the way he spoke to his father, 
speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? This poem builds to a conclusion in the final stanza, the son's memory of the father. Um, I love the image in that second line, this powerful father who had driven out the cold, right? That kind of powerful, almost godlike language um, followed, coupled with, and polished my good shoes as well. I can't help but read those two lines together and not think of our image of a God who bows before people's feet. Um, so I, I think those lines are, I can't read them without that resonance. Um, and then the final couplet, the adult, you know, remembering himself as a child, what did I know? What did I know? That repetition, and the idea of love as a lonely office, right? The lonely offices of love. Um, I, I, when I read this poem, I hear the child and the adult at the same time. Um, and I, you know, it, it, for me, it touches on some of the same ideas of that one child in that song. Anyway, I'd love to hear anybody's thoughts. I know this is the, you've only seen this poem twice now, so it's hard, you, but um, I'd love impressions if people want to share them. Yeah, Carolyn, go ahead, just jump in. I think you're on mute. This speaks to me because we had a coal fire. Coal, uh, we had a furnace when I was little, when I was very young. And so my father did get up early and start the fire. And that, that whole cracking of the cold uh, or the, the cold splintering and breaking, you could actually lie in bed and hear the heat coming on into the radiators. I actually missed it when we got a regular furnace. <laughs> but, but you could really feel that. And it's only when you're an adult that you look back and, and, and the, also polishing the shoes. He would do that. He would polish everybody's shoes for church. And, and just the idea that these things are happening and you take it for granted, you don't even uh, know about it. I, I don't think I had the chronic angers of that house, but, but except for my brother during puberty, but, <laughs> but I could really relate to this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the fact that the father was the one that's driving out the cold, I think that's very powerful. Yeah, I agree. Uh, both heavenly father and uh, earthly fathers. Yeah I, I, yeah, I can't help but read it that way as well. Yeah. I, I, think, I think it's kind of haunting and it's very reflective of, a, a, of an adult looking back at their childhood and the lack of appreciation they had. But you're kind of like, I didn't, fearing the chronic angers of that house, I didn't really see that coming. Mm -hmm. So it's all kind of nice and appreciative until that line. So there's clearly some ambiguity and he didn't have a perfect, you know, a happy childhood. I mean, that's a strong line. Thank you, Margaret. Um, but I think, yeah, I think he's, he's thinking, I still should have been more appreciative. And that last line is like really haunting. The last two lines of the poem. But that's only something as an adult you can come to. Yeah, no, I, I love the double image of this poem of the child and the adult looking back at his childhood, right? The, 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 essentially the father to the child, that expression. I, 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 we see both of them simultaneously. And you're right, Margaret, you know, this, is, this is a perspective of an adult looking back on his own childhood, um, forgiving himself, right? Um, Linda, I see you want to jump in. Well, I think that the opening stanza, the, the fact that his hands ached from labor in the weekday weather, this, this tired, worn out, angry man who never gets thanked for what he does during the week, st 
still out of love does these things that nobody thinks to thank him for uh, at home. And that sense that no matter how much hardship there is outside of that house, there's still love acted out, if not spoken. And I just think that's the kind of thing none of us notice when we're children, um, but realize when we're old. Yeah, yeah, thank you, I agree. Yeah, Sundays too. Um, well, I'll let that one sit with us for a while. Um, that's a nice thing about these poems. And, oh, and I know we said this last week, but um, we, I, we definitely will put um, uh, together the poems, the links, um, probably by the end of the three week series so that you all have them. And all, and, and certainly all these poems, and you know, and I don't know if you noticed when I showed you that image of um, Robert Hayden, that was from the Poetry Foundation's website. And that website is a wonderful resource. Um, so if you're looking for, I mean, this poem is there as are many others, but it's a great place to go for poems, for recordings, for podcasts. Um, uh, but we will definitely be compiling everything at the end of this class. All right, so the next poet I wanna talk about, um, and let me see if I can share my screen with that. The next poet I wanna talk about is Elizabeth Alexander, completely different generation, um, born in 1962. Um, a living, working poet. Um, she's cur currently the president of the Andrew Mellon Foundation, of all things. Um, so her reach is broad and powerful, and she's a very exciting contemporary voice in American poetry. Um, she actually grew up around here. She was born in Harlem, but her father um, was the first African secretary of the army, um, and she grew up here in, in D.C., went to Sidwell Friends, and then went off to Yale and the rest of her fabulous and wonderful life. Um, but uh, she uh, is a very powerful poet um, and a teacher. Um, she was actually at Yale for 15 years as a teacher and then at Columbia in 2016 onward. Um, and the poem I wanna share with you is, um, I believe, or So here's the, actually the full title, Ars Poetica number 100, I believe. And a little backstory, and Ars Poetica is a poem about poetry. And every poet writes one or if we, uh, or maybe even a hundred <laughs> um, poems about the art of poetry. And you know, they, that, this is a millennia old tradition. Um, and this is her Ars Poetica titled, I believe. And again, I'm going to read this through once myself, and then I've got a wonderful recording if I can bumble my way through um, the internet to, so we can listen to a recording of Alexander reading this poem herself. All right, I believe. Poetry, I tell my students, is idiosyncratic. Poetry is where we are ourselves, though Sterling Brown said, every eye is a dramatic eye, digging in the clam flats for the shell that snaps emptying the proverbial pocketbook. Poetry is what you find in the dirt in the corner over here on the bus, God and the details, the only way to get from here to there. Poetry, and now my voice is rising, is not all love, 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 and I'm sorry the dog died. Poetry, here I hear myself loudest, is the human voice. And are we not of interest to each other? So that is Elizabeth Alexander, I believe. And well, Zoom isn't letting me share this poem. I'm wondering, well, then I think we're gonna have to just look at the poem by itself. I'm sad that we can't share this one, but for some reason I'm having, I'm blocked. All right, I'm gonna read the poem one more time then. I'll go back to the text and recommend that you all, I'll send the link so you can hear it yourselves later. Here's Elizabeth Alexander one more time. Poetry, I tell my students, is idiosyncratic. Poetry 
is where we are ourselves. Though Sterling Brown said, every eye is a dramatic eye. Digging in the clam flats for the shell that snaps, emptying the proverbial pocketbook. Poetry is what you find in the dirt in the corner, over here on the bus, God and the details, the only way to get from here to there. Poetry, and now my voice is rising, is not all love, 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 and I'm sorry the dog died. Poetry, here I hear myself loudest, is the human voice. And are we not of interest to each other? All right. So this belief statement, right, about the importance of the human voice, the importance of the individual voice, um, the question she leaves us with at the end, are we not of importance or interest, excuse me, to each other? Again, reminds me of that song that Elise sang for us. That one voice hears one. Um, I like her opening poetry I tell my students. I love how she places this poem, right? Or this belief statement in a conversation with her students, how she enacts her speech um, and tells us that each time someone speaks, it's their own speech, it's their own voice. Um, anyway, I, I wanted to stop listening to myself talk and, uh, and ask if any of the rest of you all have thoughts about this poem. Um, it's, a, I think, a meaningful expression of belief. I'd like to say that the impression I get from this is uh, one that uh, reminds me of Shakespeare a great deal because of the choice of uh, uh, honoring poetry, uh, the uh, metaphors that are chosen, and then the, uh, what's the final, final phrases here? Uh, referring to, aren't we interested in what everyone says, I think is, uh, uh, Shakespeare is always delving into the, the guy standing by the, by the side and what do they think about things. And, uh, you know, the shell, the snaps, the, those are kinds of phrases that he might have used. So I'm, I find this has a kind of a nobility that uh, touches me. Thank you. Yeah, I love the, um, the, the particular, right? This poem is full of the particular, um, each person's particular experience, um, the proverbial pocketbook. <laughs> I, can't, I, I love the image of, you know, taking your purse and dumping it out, right? And the poem is the stuff in the bottom. If I were to take my pocketbook and dump it out, yeah. <laughs> but there's a poem there. Other thoughts about this one? I particularly like the fact that the poetry is the dust in the corner. <laughs> I mean, if you take that image and come to my house, it is so full of poetry. <laughs> You know, it's overwhelming, but I think that that's kind of what she's saying, that if you look around, you will find poetry everywhere. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, lots of, lots of poems in my house, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, am, uh, I'm, I find this poem funny. Very, very funny, oh. particularly, I mean, you know, the, I mean, the parentheticals around my voice is really rising, but just poetry. It's not all love, 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 and I'm sorry the dog died. I find that hilarious. Uh, and, and again, this notion of, you know, the dramatic eye. I mean, this is, like, this is, I think, quite a performance in the text of the poetry. And yet also wonderfully poignant at the end. And just so, I, again, very, very conceptually tight from, from top to bottom. Thanks. Yeah, no, absolutely. Performance is absolutely there. And I love the little counter voice from Sterling Brown, who is another important voice, African-American poet and essayist. And so she's giving us his you know, counter argument in the middle of her statement of her belief statement. She's saying, well, though Sterling Brown does say that every time we say I, it's a dramatic I, it's a, you know, we're performing, it's a face. So yeah, she's got this, this argument going on with herself within the poem. Um, but yeah, I love that couplet, you know, poetry. And I, you know, 
I agree with her completely. It's not all love, 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 and I'm sorry the dog died, <laughs> the poor dog. But I mean, yeah, yeah it's hilarious. Um, and the way this poem, and it's in performance, right? Those two, those parenthetical asides, and now my voice is rising. And then she, again, here I hear myself loudest. Um, yeah. It's but a, I, I think that last line echoes, it, it echoes the, Elisa's song and also the prior poem because it's basically we're missing each other like that there's a loneliness about that line like it, it's similar to the son saying I did I never noticed my I never really noticed him I never thanked him it's mm -hmm. a little to me it, there's an echo of that with that last line thank you Margaret yeah no I love that yeah and, that, then, and, the, and the one of the song Yeah, I agree. I love how all these, well, these poems, songs speak to each other. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, and like like yeah. the, the Hayden one before it, the poetry grows out of life as it is lived, that you hear in it the voice of the particular human who's experiencing it, but it calls out to the human in all of us. And am I remembering correctly, did she write the poem for one of Obama's inaugurations? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There was there was a line in that that I still remember about people passing each other by every day. And I get that same sense here that that we don't hear and we don't see, are we not of interest to each other? Yeah, yeah, I believe, right? This is her, a belief statement of hers, right? Um, the, yeah, uh, no, go ahead. I really thought the line, poetry is the only way to get from here to there. It almost, it almost gets lost in that stanza with the God and the details, which grabbed me initially. But it's quite powerful. Poetry is the only way to get from here to there. I, I was thinking as, I'm, as you were reading that again, I've written a poem like this, but it has something to do with conversations at dinner tables. And so I was thinking that, that it, all the things, the crumbs even you pick up in overhearing a conversation. And I, I keep thinking, of, and I don't, can't find the poem, but um, that I, I wrote, I've been gone to Constitution Hall, DAR Constitution Hall, and there are homeless people outside the hall. And in, I think he had a tent, this one couple had a tent and he came out and he was welcoming everyone. Well, that prompted, the only way to get from here to there, as heartbreaking as that was, because his wife was in the tent, I don't have the poem with me, calling to him, get in here, old man. I can't even remember the concert I went to see, but I'll never forget that couple. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only way to get from that Constitution Hall back to my life is to write a poem about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what she's saying too, the, the heartbrokenness or the joy, it could be the joy too. And, and how, do you, how do you deal with it except to try to con control it <laughs> in the few words you can. Thank you. That's what I get from this anyway. I, that, that's, I, I think that's lovely and very true. Maybe the only way you can touch it or try to under, try to, try, yeah, try to touch it. Um, I'd like yeah. to add that um, poetry is hard work and it forces you to think about what you're trying to express and boil down a lot of stuff into a few words. So the act of writing a poem is an act of focusing on something that's truly important to you. Yeah. Yes, thank you, it's that too. Well, that's a lovely conversation. I have one more and I realize we have 12 minutes and I, I think I will actually have time for the third poem. Um, 
so I'm going to say goodbye to this one. Um, but as I said, I'm going to send at the end of all this, we'll include the links to these poems. There is a, there, and other great resources. There's a wonderful conversation between Elizabeth Alexander and uh, Michelle Obama, um, where Alexander introduced and interviewed Obama. The two families are very close. I mean, Alexander's brother was an advisor to President Obama. Um, so the families are uh, deeply intertwined with one another. Um, but let me move on to another American poet. Uh, all right, Tracy K. Smith is the last poet I want us to spend time with today. Um, another poet laureate, former US poet laureate. Um, these days she's at Princeton, been there for a number of years. Um, and her background is uh, wonderful. Um, her father, um, was an engineer, uh, a NASA engineer, um, worked on the Hubble telescope. Her mother um, was a deeply religious woman and Smith grew up in this household um, that where spirituality and science lived together. Um, and you can see that in a lot of her poems, um, her book, Life on Mars. Oops, I'm, not, I'm holding up something you can't see. I'll, I'll show you later in her book, Life on Mars. Um, speaks to that crossroads of science and spirituality. Um, and then the poem we're going to read today, though, Wade in the Water is the title poem um, of a later book of hers, which obviously takes its reference from the spiritual tradition. Um, and there's a lot in that book um, that looks at uh, the African American spiritual tradition in particular. Um, and some of those poems are things, they're often called erasure poems, where she takes texts, other texts, and uh, listens to them um, in a new way. Um, one poem in particular, which we don't have time to, for today, Declaration, um, takes pieces from the Declaration of Independence and uh, re listens to it, um, helps us re listen to it. Um, but we're going to read uh, Wade in the Water. So I'm going to switch screens again. So the poem is Wade in the Water. And it's dedicated, as you can see, to the Geechee Gullah ring shouters, um, who are an active um, musical and faithful group um, of African American singers. Um, who trace their ancestry back to enslaved people um, who uh, th this musical tradition uh, who worship together um, in this powerful and uh, this powerful fashion. And, and I, I can show you links to th their group as well later. But um, this song came from uh, a memory of hers listening to these singers. Here goes Wade in the Water by Tracy Smith. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her and a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest. Like in a room where the drapes have been swept back. I love you. I love you as she continued down the hall past other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you throughout the performance in every hand clap, every stomp. I love you in the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty in the center of the ring. I love you in the water where they pretended to wade, singing that old blood deep song that dragged us to those banks and cast us in. I love you, the angles of it scraping at each throat, shouldering past the swirling dust motes in those beams of light that whatever we now knew, we could let ourselves feel. New to climb, oh woods, oh dogs, oh tree, oh gun, oh girl, run, oh miraculous many gone. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, O oh Lord, is this love the trouble you promised?
So that is Tracy Smith's poem, beautiful poem. And if I, this is a beautiful, we'll lose her words, but we'll see her. So I'm going to full screen it. Oh, wait a minute. I should probably make sure I've got it on video mode so that when I share screen, yes, we get the best effect. All right, here goes. called Wade in the Water, and it is dedicated to the Geechee Gullah ring shouters. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her, and a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest, like in a room where the drapes have been swept back. I love you. I love you, as she continued down the hall past other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you throughout the performance and every hand clap, every stomp. I love you in the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty in the center of the ring. I love you in the water where they pretended to wade, singing that old blood deep song that dragged us to those banks and cast us in. I love you, the angles of it scraping at each throat, shouldering past the swirling dust motes and those beams of light that whatever we now knew we could let ourselves feel new to climb. Oh, woods, oh, dogs, oh, tree, oh, gun, oh, girl, run, oh, miraculous many, gone. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Is this love the trouble you promised? That was a deep poem. Thank you, Elise. That was deep. And I think how it kind of relates to what I'm singing, and even last week, there's this sense of bondage and looking at some of the lines in Tracy's, Tracy's poem, there's images of slavery. There's images of people running for freedom, at least in my eyes. And there's images of, you know, singing that old, the line, singing that old blood deep song. That's basically what a spiritual is. It comes from struggle and devotion to God and other subjects and topics that dragged us to those banks and cast us in. But then at the line, the last line, is this love the trouble you promised? I find that a question that a lot of people should answer for themselves. But as a black person, my answer is no. <laughs> is not the love that I promise, but again, that's all something that I have to endure in my wandering or my identity, and of course, of the past of what happened. But those are the thoughts that I've, I've taken away, just in my initial thoughts, but this poem is very deep. Thanks, Elise. It is. And the lines you, you know, pointed us to, um, yes, touch us back to what you were singing. That's what Tracy Smith is reaching for, singing that old blood deep song that dragged us to those banks and cast us in. But I love that line, that line in the middle, I love you, line break. And then it scrapes, right? The angles of it scraping, right? The difficulty of, the love and the pain. Thoughts from other people about this poem? I realize we are at the end of our time, but I wanted to hear from folks. Oh. 
Well, I find it uh, surprisingly positive in that this theme of love carries through all of these lamentations. And uh, I think I think that is an uh, ironic final statement to, uh, to sort of turn your thinking is, as Lisa said, it's, it's a question for each individual that reads the poem, but it's powerful. I, I, the love of the singer, right? She greets each person. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her and a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest. I love you, I love you, as she continued down the hall past other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you throughout the performance in every hand clap, every stomp. And then I love you in the rusted iron chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty in the center of the ring. Jennifer, I uh, was reminded of John Lewis's term, good trouble, with that last line. And when you put together this concept of love running through this tragedy, and at the end is this love, the trouble you promised, I, I think of John Lewis and good trouble coming out of tragedy and love. Thank you. There's an, article, there's an article in uh, today's paper in the Washington Post magazine, and it's um, an article about men and the difficulty of saying I love you to other men. That, and it, it pulls this in as well. It's a trouble. And in the first poem with the little boy, he didn't ever say to his father, I love you or thank you, that we stumble over it. And in this poem, the woman is sharing this love with other people and they're taking it as, as something um, hard to embrace, to hold inside them. But, you know, it's, love is a terrible thing. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, love is a terrible thing. Well, maybe, go ahead. It Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the last line is sort of perplexing. Um, it, well, more than sort of. It's almost like it should be, given the, the context, it should be, is this trouble the love you promised? Um, mm -hmm. Sort of saying you were, you know, you, 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 you promised me better things than, than the enslavement I ended up with, uh, but it inverts that and suggests somehow uh, forgiveness or uh, compassion or I I'm not sure what. It's just a it's a very ironic line to me. Thank you. No, I agree. I think they're both there, and that's in. And I think I said this last week, or I'll just say the obvious about poetry um, is the way it plays at um, the way language means multiple things or one word has multiple reference. And I think, yes, this line allows or calls for that kind of inversion. Um, is this love the trouble you promised or is this trouble the love you promised? I think they're both there. Um, thank you. They're both there. Well, I leave us with these poems, these words. Thank you for your words, sharing them with us. Um, Elise's voice, Linda's words, everyone's words and their thoughts. These are hard and powerful and loving poems. Um, and uh, it was wonderful to share them with everyone this morning. 
So I wish everyone a good Sunday.